the company's mission is to redefine secondary storage. Uh, and I'll talk about our vision and what secondary storage means and why it needs to be redefined in my next few slides. Uh, so bear with me. Uh, the company at this time is uh, uh, four and a half years old. It was uh, founded in the summer of 2013. My background is that I was the, uh, the co-founder and CTO of Nutanix. So I'm credited to be the brains behind the concept of hyperconvergence, although I was blessed with a very good team that really made it possible. Sometimes get too much credit for that. And uh, in past life, as Lynn said, I helped build the Google file system. So I, pretty much any data that sits in Google, Gmail, uh, YouTube, what have you, eventually touches some of that code, um, hopefully still. Um, uh, a little bit about, about our business momentum. Uh, we, at this point, have hundreds of customers. Um, uh, and the nice thing is that 70% of those customers are enterprise customers, the large companies in the world. Uh, uh, some of the logos are here. Uh, you know, you'll see some notable logos. This is just a small subset of our customers. Shutterstock, Tribune Media, Credit Acceptance, and um, you know, some of the big, biggest banks in Europe, in Tessa San Paolo, the US Air Force, and uh, the list goes on and on and on. So very proud of uh, our customers and what we can do for them. Um, last year, we had 600% revenue growth, um, so, so great momentum in, um, in our traction. And, and we've been growing very, very fast. Uh, just uh, from September last year, we've uh, nearly uh, grown by 50% in our headcount. So really growing very, very fast. So, so with that, let's begin uh, talking about what uh, we're about, the, the vision. So this picture shows the, the infrastructure that our, our customers have to run their applications. On the left side of the slide, uh, I show the data center. Right, they're on-prem data center, something that they own. And on the right side, I show the, the, the cloud, or public cloud, and all the different vendors, Azure, Amazon, Google, and even any uh, private cloud that they may have in the data center. Uh, and we regard anything that's S3 or NFS-based as a, as, a, as a private cloud. So the cloud and uh, the data center. So uh, let's start with the data center. Uh, let's see what's uh, there in the data center. What we do is we map the storage in the data center to an iceberg. Um, and I've shown the iceberg here. The tip of the iceberg is what we refer to as primary storage. That's where our customers run their mission critical apps. These are apps that um, require strict SLAs. My, my last company, Nutanix, um, and a number of other notable companies like Pure Storage, Nimble, Tintry, they all operate in that space, right? So you send a request, and the response is expected back within a few milliseconds. The SLAs are kind of strict. Your production depends on it. But the bulk of what we do in a data center is the boring kind, um, the non-SLA driven kind, the non-mission critical kind, uh, if you may. And that's the part that lies beneath the surface of water. And that's the part that we refer to as secondary storage. Right? <coughs> that's our definition of secondary storage. Let's see um, what comprises primary and secondary storage. Um, so in primary storage, we have some apps, production apps, like I said. But secondary storage is a little bit more nuanced. It has multiple workflows. Um, let's start by naming some of them. Um, the first one I will talk about is backups. Um, so whatever we run in the primary space, we ne need that backed up. The second one is archival for long-term data ret retention. If we need to store data for the long term, think tapes or equivalent means of doing archival, uh, that's what this is about. Yet another one is analytics. Um, so notice that I put analytics as part of secondary space. Because bulk of analytics is of the kind um, that is not SLA driven. Where we have spent 10 hours crunching through some data, it's OK to spend 20 more minutes. So the SLAs are not strict. Now, there is some analytics that also falls as part of the primary space. That's real-time analytics. But a large part of analytics falls in this uh, lower part of the iceberg. And that's why we regard it as part of secondary storage. Um, uh, uh, test and dev also falls as part of um, secondary storage. Uh, our developers do need high performance. But once in a while, if the SLAs are missed, it's OK. If most of the time, their responses, they're getting responses within five milliseconds. But some of the time, they come back in 50 milliseconds, it's OK. So that's why test and lab is part of the space. And a lot of what we do in, uh, in our filers and object um, storage systems falls in this space. Think about object dumps or image dumps or a lot of the secondary uh, uh, ca use cases for filers and objects <coughs> falls in this space. So that brings us to the question, what's the problem with the left side, the, especially the secondary side? Why does cohesity exist? Well, I think uh, the problems kind of jump out of this slide itself. 
the first problem is that the space is very fragmented. Every one of these workflows is catered to by a different vendor. Um, and even within backups, in the legacy world, our customers have to go to different vendors. One vendor to go buy backup software from, another vendor to buy storage from, yet another vendor to buy a piece of hardware <coughs> called a media server and then to run the backup software on that, some proxies, master servers, oh my god. So a lot of fragmentation, and outside of backups, another vendor to buy your file shares from, yet another one to run your test and lab on. So bottom line is our customers are juggling multiple UIs, they're dealing with multiple vendors, they're dealing with multiple licensees. It's a big manageability headache. That's one big problem. The second big problem is that the space is highly inefficient. Whatever we back up today, it's the same data that sits on an analytics environment somewhere, it's the same data that sits on a test and dev environment somewhere. So we essentially have lots and lots of copies throughout the data center, uh, and analysts like IDC say that um, you know, we spend, uh, the world, worldwide we spend something like $50 billion maintaining these unnecessary copies than we would if there were no unnecessary copies. That's inefficient. And I think one more aspect of inefficiency I'll talk about is the fact that I think you'll agree that backups today are nothing more than an insurance policy. We have these siloed backup products that sit there and do nothing but provide peace of mind. Uh, they are not normally used unless we actually lose data or we need to retrieve data for compliance purposes. So, so, so that is inefficient. Why do we buy all this expensive backup infrastructure and never use it, right? So, so that's inefficient. And the last aspect of uh, the problem I want to say is that the space is very dark. People don't have any insights into what's going on. Uh, whenever they need to get any insights, they'll have to copy everything out into yet another silo, analytics, uh, and then get some insights. And it's prohibitively expensive. It's impractical to move exabytes or petabytes of data into yet another silo. So these are some of the problems that plague the space. Um, and I sometimes say that the left side, the, the data center, is kind of like owning a house, right? And the right side, is available for rent. And if your house is messy, then people will run away and start living in places for rent, like hotels. And that's been what has been happening for some years now. Uh, because of this mess uh, on the left, people uh, you know, will run over to the right side. And then when they run over to the right side, the problem doesn't quite go away. We all know that hotels can be expensive. If you go live in hotels, uh, one or two days is fine but you stay there consistently, it starts getting expensive. And by the way, um, you know, whatever mess we had here, just because we throw that to someone like Amazon doesn't mean that that mess goes away. So for instance, if there are copies here, you'll end up having copies in Amazon. So we've actually moved some of that mess over to the right side. And then uh, the world says, well, oh, um, this is getting too expensive and, and messy too, then let's um, move back. And that's the confusion the world kind of lives in. And that's what prompted me to um, kind of come up with, me and my team to come up with concepts like happy convergence. So, so let me see um, what we do, how we look at things, right? So there's a massive opportunity here for modernization. I'll just briefly say that our philosophy is first, let's simplify that house. Let's get rid of the mess in the house, right? But we also believe the world is a great place because of both houses <coughs> and the stuff that's available for rent. So we want to build a product that provides the best of both worlds. But let's begin by cleaning up the house. So that's where my, in my last company, me and my team um, invented the concept of happy convergence. So we simplified the tip of the iceberg by introducing happy convergence there. Made that really, really ma manageable, right? <coughs> and in Cohesity, we started off <coughs> by looking at the lower part of the iceberg. So we start by looking at the mess created by legacy backup products. Right? Uh, I already mentioned, very fragmented, you have to go to three or four different vendors. They, you know, another problem is they don't scale out. So anytime you fill them up, you have to do forklifts. So let's introduce Cohesity, a very simple product that scales in a Google-like fashion and that can roll in and simplify the data protection in the, in the data center. So we come in and boom, uh, we simplify the job of doing backups, a very Apple-like UI. Um, scales in a Google-like fashion. You add nodes to the cluster, there is no down, downtime. Um, you know, when new nodes are added, we even discover nodes using Apple's Bonjour protocol, so that sort of stuff. Once we've done that, we say, okay, let's you know, simplify the left side more. And at the same time, let's also recognize that the rental stuff is also great for something. If I have some crud in my house that I don't want to throw away, uh, but I also don't want to keep in my house, I will rent a storage box and then put it there. Not a hotel, I'll rent a storage box and put it there. 
And cloud today has uh, such services like Amazon Glacier and the equivalent ones in Google and, and, and Azure. So, so we um, simplify the job of doing archivals by archiving onto the cloud. And later down in, in this presentation, uh, some of our engineers will talk uh, more about our archival feature and how we do that. And one of the things I'll mention right up front is we can actually dedupe all this stuff on the cloud so we can drive down the cost of archival sometimes below that of tape. Um, so, so now that we've simplified uh, some part of the secondary storage, let's move on. Let's say um, the next part, we say, why do people have all these silos from vendors that sell filers and object storage um, sitting there uh, separately? Let's consolidate that on the KZD data platform. And by doing that, now our customers can use one UI to manage all of it. At the same time, they also <coughs> get the advantage of copy data management, because everything on this cluster, this distributed cluster, is globally deduplicated. Whether the data comes through from backups or through another protocol, SMB, NFS, S3, and through our files and object storage, we expose all that. Some of our engineers will talk about that. We deduplicate everything. Right? So now we've simplified the job of running files and, and object storage. The next one, if our customers now need to run some test and dev, let's consolidate that on this, this, this appliance. Why should a development team today have to go to um, an admin and then have the admin spend weeks procuring some storage for running a test and dev environment, then copy the data to it, because our developers want to work on realistic data, and then a, a test and dev environment gets ready. Here, uh, test and dev environments get ready in seconds. Right? Uh, just clone using our um, snap pre-cloning technology, and the test and dev environment is ready. As simple as that. And finally, why do we have all those analytic silos sitting on the side? Why not consolidate them on this platform? Our big philosophy is, Let's move compute to the data, not the data to the compute. Let's keep the data in one place. You already have it in one place by virtue of the fact that you are doing backups. Let's move compute to it. Let's move analytics to it. Let's create clones and run analytics on that. Right? Let's not have data moving to the compute, which is what is done in the legacy world, where we take the data and move it to wherever compute is running, move it to where an analytics platform is running. Right? So this way, we further get rid of the copies. So, so this, this phenomenon of consolidating whole of your secondary storage is a phrase that we refer to as, as hyperconverged secondary storage. I sometimes like, liken this approach to what a smartphone did in the consumer space. Before the smartphone, we all used to carry a phone, a music player, a camera, a flashlight, a GPS device, and so on and so forth. And the smartphone came and it consolidated all of that on, one, on that one platform. Okay? But we don't stop, we don't stop here. Uh, we like, okay, let's also you know, extend ourselves to the cloud. Remember, we want to provide the goodness of both the, cloud, uh, both the data center, the house, as well as stuff that's available for rent. We are already providing the goodness of the cloud uh, for archival purposes. How about as a hotel? <coughs> Notice how we use a hotel. We use a hotel for flexibility. Uh, we have Tahoe close by. If I need to ski, I'll go to um, Tahoe maybe once a year and then rent a hotel, um, stay there for a couple of days, and then um, you know, I come back. Uh, and then I don't have to pay for the hotel. So similarly, the cloud in the cloud, you can spin up stuff and spin them down, and then you don't have to pay for it. So, so let's look at how we accomplish that. We will now run Qhezity as a virtual cluster on the cloud, making all those workloads that I show on the left possible to be run on the right side. And now that we've made this possible, let's connect the two Qhezities. Any two Qhezities can connect to each other transfer data back and forth and stuff. So since we have now two QSDs, one physical, one virtual, <coughs> let's connect the two. And in essence, now we've built a infrastructure continuum or a data continuum, right? Uh, sometimes I say this is like plumbing. Um, this, is, this is your house, and this is the plumbing that connects your house to the hotel. Uh, and, and you only think about plumbing if the plumbing is bad. If the plumbing is good, you think about the quality of your life, the quality of your entertainment, and so on and so forth. That's what we're trying to do. To, to encompass this whole thing. That's our vision. But I, I want to be very upfront. And I also say we don't want to boil the ocean. We don't want to say that we are jack of all trades and master of none. Just like a smartphone is a great phone to begin with, we enter the data center by being a great best in class data protection platform. And once we've conquered that, then we go on and simplify the rest of it. So, so we've um, made impressive inroads in how we perform as a data protection platform. But all of the rest of this also exists. Sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. This is what we are innovating upon. Okay? So this is the big vision. I'm now going to focus on some aspects of what makes this vision possible. Right? This is the vision behind Qhezity. 
So the first thing that makes this possible is uh, our, our file system. So we've, we've, we've built a distributed file system that we call SpanFS. The name comes from the fact that the, the file system spans nodes in a data center. It spans storage tiers in a data, data center, like SSDs, uh, you know, hard drives, and so on and so forth. And it also spans um, the, the, the data center and the cloud. So, so let's talk about some of the virtues of this file system. The first one is that uh, it has unlimited scalability. Now, uh, unlimited is a word that can never be uh, you know, ta you know, proven. But we have uh, tested our scalability to 256 nodes by running a virtual cluster on, on Azure and running some performance tests against it and in every category. Random reads, random writes, sequential reads, sequential writes. The performance kept on linearly increasing as more nodes were added to the cluster. Okay, and some of the past systems I've built, Nutanix and especially the Google file system, they were also uh, built with technology that could scale to very, very large nodes. So, so there is no single point of bottleneck. There is no master or queen node in the system. There is nothing uh, special in this architecture that if that fails, the whole system will be down. This is a truly, truly scalable system. So theoretically, it sh it can keep on uh, scaling. The next thing is that uh, it has a feature that we call strict consistency as opposed to eventual consistency. Uh, at a high level, uh, I'll have Ganesh, uh, you know, our, our director of engineering, talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but at a high level, uh, this means that you can trust what you write on this file system. So if you write something and then later read it back, it's not like it will give you stale data or tell you that this data was never written. Strictly consistent means that if you write something, anytime you read it back, you get the same answer. That's strictly consistent. Eventually so, consistent means something else. So strictly consistent applies to the S3 cloud version of it Absolutely. as well? Okay. Absolutely. Okay. It applies to all our protocols. So I sometimes say SpanFS is kind of like a human being that sits underneath, and that human being talks multiple languages. One of them is S3, another one is NFS, and another one is SMB. So all those get the benefit of what SpanFS provides. The next one is multi-protocol. We already uh, spoke about that. Um, SpanFS can be exposed to the rest of the world through NFS, SMB, and S3. And of course, we have controls in place so, you, so people can authenticate before coming in. So it's very secure. Um, the next one, global dedupe. A anything on SpanFS, and it's very software-driven. Um, our customers can s um, uh, make so build software abstractions and set a policy that, hey, um, this abstraction should be globally deduplicated. Uh, any data that comes in, whether it comes through backups, or it's written through NFS, SMB, or S3, or it comes through any other means, uh, gets deduplicated against the other. So we support global dedupe in that fashion. Uh, and, um, and our dedupe also uses variable sized blocks, so it's not fixed size blocks. So if you have two files that get, uh, one of them gets shifted by a little bit, uh, we can still dedupe that. So that's the kind of technology we support for our dedupe. Uh, the next one is snap trees. Uh, this is technology that we invented. Um, at a high level, uh, the traditional problem with cloning is that if you try to create too many clones, uh, what essentially happens is that every time you create a clone, um, a, a, chain uh, the ch a chain starts getting formed, and every clone adds a link to that chain. And when you then access that clone, things slow down because you potentially have to traverse a big chain. Uh, again, I'll have Ganesh talk more about that, but we have technology where these chains don't form, and therefore we can take snapshots not only in a distributed uh, fashion, but also very, very frequently. Um, and so we don't have any slowdown as a result. Finally, we have um, self-healing. So um, this, um, this system was built to self-heal itself. Um, there is no assumption that something will be down, and some admin needs to come running to fix the system within like 15 minutes, or else there is danger, it will self-heal itself. Um, and based on the parameters that our customers set, um, you know, you can set it up for erasure coding. I'll talk more about that and set those parameters. And that determines how many failures can you tolerate any time before the system uh, can, needs to um, heal itself. Automated tiering. Um, so um, SpanFS also spans tiers of storage. Hard data sits on SSDs. Uh, and when it gets cold, uh, and coldness can be defined by our customers, maybe one hour is cold, maybe one day is cold. It'll water for the, water, the data will water fall down to hard drives. And when it gets colder still, if the cloud is connected to it, it'll water fall down, down to the cloud. So, so automatic tiering. And, and when the data becomes hot again, it's up tiered similarly. Um, so that's supported by SpanFS. Multi-cloud, we can simultaneously work with multiple clouds, um, you know, Azure, Google, um, you know, and anything that might be NFS or S3 compl uh, compliant. So we can work with multiple clouds at the same time. And I'll let some of other, my other colleagues talk about the cloud technology. Sequential and random IO, this is a file system that's not meant just as a sequential, um, uh, sequentially performant uh, file system. 
you can really l run live workloads that do lots and lots of random I/O on this, and it'll be very efficient. And I think some of the efficiency comes from the fact that hard data sits on SSDs, and therefore can sustain that random I/O quite quite nicely. Uh, Multi-tenancy with QoS. Uh, the one uh, nice thing about having silos in secondary storage is that the, whatever runs in those silos has no chance of stepping on each other. But when you consolidate stuff on one platform, now that those workloads can uh, step on each other, and therefore we built in a multi-tenancy in QoS to prevent uh, those guys from stepping on each other, to provide some performance isolation between each other. And the last one is global indexing and search. Um, again, based on policy, uh, whatever is being ingested, maybe through backups, our customers can set policies, and we'll actually index um, whatever is coming in. And, and then we provide a Google-like search box that our customers can go and search for information. So, so uh, if so they're Mohit, you actually yes. are cracking open files and, and looking at text and Word documents and PDFs. And so we, we do not um, um, index the data. What We are cracking open VMs uh, and, and looking at the files in that VM and indexing the names of those files. The metadata of the files. Um, the metadata, yeah. that's right. Metadata. Uh, data would require too much um, storage. It will require double the amount of storage it's for indexing. Typical, it's typical. Uh, but there is uh, another technology we have. If you do want to st uh, search inside the data, um, our analytics ability, and we call it the analytics workbench, the very first um, you know, tech field day in 2015 that we did, actually demoed that ability. So you could inject custom pieces of code uh, in our platform, and then we run our MapReduce to maybe search through that data. So we have federal customers um, searching for classified information using that technology. We have another customer who stores uh, high fidelity videos and then converting that to low fidelity videos using that technology. So we have both. Hmm. Okay. Next one up, um, let's talk a little bit about the cloud. Uh, and I'll let um, some of my colleagues talk way, way more. So this is the data platform. And uh, I just want to say that uh, you know, we extend ourselves from both the edge. So you can have a, a remote office branch office. Um, so we have offerings for that. You can run us as a virtual VM on the edge, or, or there's a stripped down version of our appliance that you can run on the edge case. And this might be your headquarters, and then we connect to the cloud. So we can uh, span all those cases. Uh, so we make all that possible. Um, this is the summary slide, and I'll then pass it on to, to Ganesh. Um, I, I, I wish to talk about how we are different than so, um, so many more that came before, and how we stand on their shoulders to build something more. Um, there's the vision itself, but let's specifically talk about our, 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 our file system. So first of all, we have global space efficiency. Um, so we have global dedupe, uh, and it's a variable, variable block in nature. We also support erasure coding um, in a distributed fashion. Um, QoS, I already spoke about that, uh, and Ganesh will speak a little bit more. Uh, we can provide isolation between all these workloads. Instant master store. Um, so because of our cloning technology, um, and not only can we take distributed clones, we can take them very, very frequently. So every backup essentially results in a clone being taken and then um, an incremental backup perhaps being put onto that clone. It's fully hydrated. Ganesh will show a little bit more about that. The nice thing is now that we have all these um, clones, we can now recover from them instantly. Not only can we recover one VM or one backup instantly, we can potentially recover multiple VMs instantly. Press a button and thousands of VMs are up and running instantly. Uh, I'll let so when you say uh, recover instantly, are you actually mounting the, the storage on Cohesity for those VMs? Tem temporarily, the, uh, Cohesity will serve as the data store. Uh, but all the magic behind the scenes is done by us. So the customer will not see that. But yeah, the, we will be serving the data. So as the data gets funneled to the primary system, we will be serving the data. And then once the funnel is, is complete, in the background, imagine there's a storage vMotion going on, then uh, we'll no longer be serving the data. Uh, data resiliency. Um, through six consistency, again, you can trust what you write on us. Um, and, and so the data integrity is, is, is guaranteed. That's the kind of file system we've built. And finally, um, you know, cloud and app integration. And I'll let uh, my colleagues talk way more about that. Uh, but just want to say we are multi-protocol. So you can write stuff to SpanFS through, let's say, NFS, and read it out through S3, or vice versa. You can write stuff through NFS and something else through uh, uh, SMB or something else through S3. All of that will get deduplicated. So there is universal access. You can have a legacy app writing to us through maybe NFS or SMB, move that data to the cloud, and have a cloud app read it out through S3. So it provides universal access to data. It provides that true hybrid cloud uh, that a lot of our customers want. 